Welcome to Oh God What Now, I'm Jacob Jarvis. On today's show, who is in the running to be the new Conservative Party leader? And realistically, can any of them save it or are they all just more of the same? Then Andrew Harrison sits down with the co-leader of the Green Party, Carla Denyer, to find out what she thinks of Labour's Green policies, what the Greens can achieve, and whether they're actually the left-wing alternative to Labour. Plus, now that Labour is in power, Angela Rayner has waded in on house building. Can the government actually hit its targets, and are those targets even the right targets? Then, in the extra bits for supporters, a lot of politicians have gone a bit too Gen Z online for our liking. Do some of them need to stop trying? trying so hard. Now, let's meet today's panel. First, it's Associate Political Editor of the New Statesman, Rachel Cunliffe. Hi, Rachel. Hello. Rachel, so Reeves has said she will raise some taxes in October, but she's still quite coy on which and where. Why is she being fuzzy on clarity at this point, when to me it sounds like the plan kind of is to raise them for a minority of better off people and away from direct income taxes for, for lower, lower earners. Why not just be clear at this point? So uh, Rachel Reeve said that uh, the financial situation was even more dire than uh, we had expected, which we were actually expecting her to say. And she said this on the News Agents podcast. But <laughs> I think that's 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 the point: is that she was chatting on a podcast and then said taxes will probably have to rise. And generally, nothing against podcasts. Obviously, I would make an exception for this one on the NS podcast. But I do think cabinet secretaries probably shouldn't be announcing government policy on. Mm podcast, there are other ways of doing it. And one of uh, Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves' big things that they're going quite hard on is doing stuff really by the book in a way that previous prime ministers, in particular Liz Truss, did not. So the budget has been set for the 30th of October. Uh, the OBR, Office of Budget Responsibility, has got 10 weeks to prepare forecasts. They're doing it uh, according to a very clearly set out timetable. And I don't think we're going to get any sort of sneak peek details of what might be in there in terms of tax rises before that uh, for for those reasons leaving aside the fact that every time uh, there's even a hint of tax rises then Jeremy Hunt and the Conservatives and the Conservative media all go into a tailspin. So that's why you're not hearing more about how they're going to raise them. I think though you're right, capital gains tax looks set to rise. It was one of the few that Labour didn't explicitly rule out in their manifesto. They said no increases to income tax, national insurance mm. or VAT. Possible look at council tax bounds as well. That's another one that they didn't rule out. But essentially, they've got to raise an awful lot of extra money while having made a commitment not to increase the three biggest drivers of government revenue. So it's a it's a tough challenge for them. One of the things you have to respect the the past Tory governments for as well is they did always follow the protocol of releasing their announcements in the sun. At least, so you know you can't you can't now devolve to podcast. You've got to go for the the top draw media for that sort of thing. Next with us, we have a journalist specialising in social affairs. It's Hannah Fern. Hi, Hannah. Hello, Hannah. There is a bit of a backlash over the whole winter fuel allowance being scrapped. Even if it is fiscally sensible, does this also feel like a point though where the government maybe should be? putting that aside to do what is maybe morally right rather than the balancing the book side of things? Or is that a wider question that the morally right thing is to balance the books? Yeah, I think there were two points, really. I do think we are at a point where the, the money situation is so tight that actually you've got to look for any possible way to, to you know, to, to make cuts that don't impact on um, the poorest people. And actually, there was no real moral principle around the winter fuel allowance. The reason it was sent to everyone, the reason it became a, a universal benefit in the first place is that um, to means testing those kind of things is so expensive that it was simpler for them to just give it to everyone. Mm. Um, and this was obviously, it was introduced at a point when pensioners overall were much more, uh, you know, uh, compared to the rest of the working population, were much more likely to, to be earning less, to have a lower household income and to be struggling. That is not the case now for loads of reasons. Are well reported, housing wealth, um, you know, more the stagnation of current wage earners, well, pensions have been triple locked and so on. Um, so actually, I think it is both the morally right thing to do and practically easier and it gets uh, money you know, back into the Treasury um, by saving on that. But the, th the thing that they now have to address is that we've probably got a situation where the pension credit, so winter fuel allowance will still stay for those who are claiming pension credit benefits, so for the very poorest pensioners, of which there is actually uh, a small but significant number. And some of them are, are actually really, really poor, you know, facing yeah. destitution. So it's a really important issue that they still retain it. And they will retain it with the pension credit, but we actually probably have a situation now where 
pension credits should probably be reviewed in terms of bringing the threshold up a bit so more people qualify for pension credit and then mm. that will offset any concerns around this measure to withdraw this benefit from the majority actually causing poverty. I think yeah. there is a small population that it could negatively affect and we need to look at how that can be prevented without means testing everyone because yeah. that's just ridiculous. Is that always the issue though that with anything like this there comes a band in the middle who end up falling I out mean, of falling out like, the lower and yeah. they're in the higher but they're obviously not actually that much more fortunate. It's a bit like every tax band um all of those issues just yeah, there, there's going to be uh, someone who just misses out. Um, but I do think at the moment there is a, a fraction who who really will be affected by this particular measure. And also we know that pension credit overall is one of the most undertaken benefits, if that makes sense. Okay. So people who qualify for it don't know they can get it or they don't think they're going to qualify. So part of the government's push here is to encourage people to apply for pension credit to keep their when to fuel allowance. So hopefully a lot more people will claim that benefit that they are entitled to and has been underclaimed for some time. Okay, well, yeah, fingers crossed there are some more people who actually become aware of help they can get, at least can be some slight sort of Fraser Nelson here. wrote in The Spectator that he... Knew, I, I find myself in weird agreement with him. Mm. We rarely are in agreement. Um, he, he wrote that it was ridiculous that some of his friends had been claim, had taken the winter fuel allowance, of course, because it goes to everybody, and then were spending it on you know luxury bottles of champagne and posh mm. wines and so on. I, you know, I know people who were claiming it because you know who received it and then donated it to food banks. You know, yeah. There are things you can do with it if you don't need it that aren't just enjoying the spoils of a, a government yeah. that's struggling, you know? Yeah, I suppose. It just feels like with all these things, it always has to be, it's a blanket measure which puts people into to blocks, which then maybe makes us forget about the, the smaller, smaller percentages of those. And finally, making up the panel, we have the author of A History of the World in 47 Borders and Paper Cuts podcast regular, John Elledge. Hi, John. Hello. I'm recovering from an ear infection, so if I fall off my chair at any point, please <laughs> yeah. do forgive me. Or if you ignore me at any point, you can just pretend what? that's your excuse. <laughs> <laughs> John, the, the political blame game, I think, does turn some people off of politics and off of watching politics. But is Labour's tactic in going down the route of pointing that out in one way slightly a bit refreshing because they are finally using the tactics the Tories would and did use against them. You still hear the sort of 2008 financial crash line used against Labour all these years later. So it just simply feels like they're, they're playing the game that would be played against them. Oh, God, totally. It's brilliant. I mean, like, <laughs> Greg Hans, then the chair of the Conservative Party, was still talking, still waving Liam Burns' infamous there's no money <laughs> note yeah. around in, like, April or something, like, you know, within the last couple of months. Um, so, like, you know, seeing an actual ch a Labour chance to stand up and go, well, the Tories have left the books yeah. in a terrible state, which is true, um, seems seems only fair. Um, also, like, there's various other tricks they're using, like the, the housing targets look to me like they've kind of fallen slightly more heavily on, on areas that didn't vote Labour than on areas that did. Mm. Which is which is um, which you've been advocating for? Which I have been advocating for. So, so maybe I'm maybe, delighted. They, maybe they've been reading your columns. Maybe they have. <laughs> um, but also, like the the you were just talking about the winter fuel allowance thing. Like one way of reading the Rachel Reeves statement this week is is taking money from rich pensioners and giving it to underpaid public sector workers. And we can have a conversation about you know the importance of universal benefits and stuff like that. But that is not obviously a an unprogressive way of behaving. So it's kind of, it, it's sort of been interesting to me seeing various Tory commentators like Tim Montgomery sitting on the internet pretending to be shocked and appalled <laughs> yeah. Yeah. by this stuff. And it basically seems like they're saying, well, well, you know, obviously we do this, but we expected better from you. <laughs> um, it also, I think part of it is just like there is a particular, let's be honest, there is a particular subset of the electorate who in the last few years have got very used to being pandered to uh, and and basically being on the winning side of every political decision. And now they're not going to be because we have a different government with different yeah. political interests. Uh, and this is just that playing out. Yeah, I, I, I feel what you mean. I just I can't help but think there are, I feel sorry for the people who fall into the edges of those kind of Venn diagrams. Yeah, and think there, that that there is... are always going to be edge cases. And actually, I'm personally quite sympathetic to the the case for universal benefits and it kind of makes yeah. it easier to defend the idea of a a redistributive state. But, you know, we are in a crisis here and there is money being paid to people who don't need it at a time when the NHS is going to fall over. But mm. they didn't. I, I don't remember this outcry when they started means testing 
child benefit and that is obviously child benefit not uh, in terms of universal credit but the the what was the universal benefit for mm. encouraging people to to have more children which is a bit of a problem that we've got and uh, the threshold for that is based on one parent earning a certain sure. amount and it seems like quite a high amount but it's based on one parent rather than a household and it kind of essentially means that if you earn more than a certain amount, which in London, if you've got a mortgage, isn't a huge amount, your tax rate goes up to 60%, your it's marginal ridiculous. tax rate. Insane, yeah. And it, it, obviously that's a distorted system and you can argue about whether those people need the money or not. But I don't remember this kind of outcry of universal benefits by principle when sure. that was brought in. Sure, the I, I just those worry. guys, they didn't vote Tory, did they? So <laughs> you can see the problem. Yeah, I worry that a, a rule of thumb being that people didn't get so annoyed when the Tories did stuff like this no, is, is not necessarily the most uh, moral route to go down, but I don't know. You're maybe, a better person than us. And, uh, I'm not, not going to say that, but you know, if, I, if listeners want to I mean, say I, so. I do think that there is a difference between the two in that when um, child benefit was first introduced, the whole point was that it was designed as that, this universal benefit, that it was attached to the child, not the family, that mm. it's about making sure that every child has the same start and the same support. The winter fuel allowance, the reason that it was always, it never was means tested was just the cost of that. It wasn't kind of, I don't think, a great moral decision that everybody everybody in later life deserves this payment, even if they're sitting on sure. three million pounds of housing wealth. Before we start, don't forget Oh God What Now live in Liverpool on Monday the 23rd of September, right in the middle of Labour Conference. Regulars Dorian Linsky, Raf Bear and John Elledge will be joined by a special guest at the Laughter House Comedy Club for a classic night of political soothsaying and analysis. Tickets are on sale now and selling like hot scouse pies. Go to the link at the top <laughs> of the show notes or to laughterhousecomedy.com to get yours. And there's another Not London show coming soon as Patreon backers will already know. Where is it? When is it? How much is it? There's only two ways to find out. Search Patreon Oh God What Now and sign up to get booking info and a discount or wait until next week. The choice is yours, but if you're impatient like me, I know which one I would go for. That's Oh God What Now on a world tour of Britain. Don't miss it. <laughs> The fight for the Conservative Party leadership is officially underway after nominations closed on Monday, although I think it had been kind of unofficially on the way for quite some time. There are several recognisable names who made it onto the list. Kemi Badenoch, Tom Tugendhat, James Cleverley, Pretty Patel, Mel Stride and Robert Jenrick. Who's Mel Stride? Yeah, I was being quite generous there, wasn't I? That's, <laughs> a, that's a question down the line. Over the, over the next few months, they will battle it out to be the one who succeeds Rishi Sunak when he either eventually jets off to LA or becomes a really dedicated backbench constituency MP. I'll let Take you guys decide which is most likely. So who has a chance, who doesn't, and can any of them actually save the Conservative Party? Rachel, we're starting to see the public side of things now, and I'm sure it's going to get quite messy. But it's actually been quite a mess for a while behind the scenes, hasn't it? Yeah, so just the details of this contest have been quite a mess. So the Conservative Leadership Contest rules are set by the chair of the 1922 Committee of Backbench Conservative MPs. That used to be Sir Graham Brady. He stood down in the last election. So the first thing was they needed to elect a new chair. And there was controversy over that, over the voting time with MPs turning up to vote. And then the vote had already happened. So um, <laughs> the new chair is Bob Blackman, who is Conservative MP for Harrow East. And he has the, I think he's the one of the only Conservative MPs in London. Mm. Um, but he has the unenviable task of organising the rules for this. And there was a sense that the, well, the last Conservative leadership contest wasn't really a contest. It was a coronation of Rishi Sunak taking over from Liz Truss. But the one before that, the summer one in 2022, there was a sense that the opening rounds where MPs voted and whittled it down to the final two happened too quickly and that meant that the final two candidates that went to the membership were Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, neither of whom the membership particularly liked and we all know what happened there. So they wanted to try and avoid that happening and really give lots of time to really examine these people. Uh, but there was a bit of back and forth with meetings between the Conservative Party board and the 1922 committee about the timing, uh, about whether they wanted to have it wrapped up by Conservative Party conference in uh, the end of September, mm. or whether they wanted to have it go on longer. And if they were going to have it go on longer, who was going to be in charge in the interim? Was Rishi Sunak going to stay on? Was they going to were, were they going to appoint some kind of caretaker leader? 
And they've sort of ended up in this kind of bizarre system where we're not going to have the winner until the 2nd of November. So I think three days before the, the US election. And the whole of the first month is just the six candidates going around the country, doing speeches, talking to the media, talking to people. MPs aren't going to get a chance to start voting until September. Then they're going to get it down to the final four at Conservative Party conference. Uh, and they're all going to get to do speeches. And then we're going to have another month of, um, okay. of, of voting. And it's just it's just a very long, drawn-out way with Rishi Sunak staying in place to do PMQs that seems to have been designed to try and please everyone and I think may end up backfiring. It sounds like a really shit Britain's Got Talent in some way. But it is, <laughs> it's interesting to see the Tories wanting to have some sort of positive voting reform, actually, within their party, at least. They, it's a shame <laughs> they don't want that for everyone for everyone else. The, I the mean, I thought last, last year felt like it really messed a Conservative leadership contest over the summer. <laughs> We've got so used to it. it I, I think I think the, the spirit of Conservative Party leadership contest has really been commercialised. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's designed, though, to take the heat out of it but extending mm. it over that period of time is surely just going to make them reach for the most aggressive tactics what? just to be able to get through it and I don't think it will take the heat out of it because there's so they're not used to the fact that they're in opposition uh, and that when you're in opposition most of the media attention is on I don't know the government and so just getting the media to pay attention will require people to say noticeable things which incentivizes them to say stupid things. say stupid things mm. to get noticed well people who say stupid things to get noticed the top name at the moment seems to be kemi badenoch why isn't the party rallying around someone more when she seems like the she does seem very much the front runner is it because although she might unify numbers in within the party the parliamentary party and maybe with the membership you know it might not more widely be a unifying move. I love how you're calling for unity around Kemi Bay. I, I don't know. I'm not saying I I know what you're saying and it's a it's uh, it's deliberately a counterintuitive <laughs> question no. but you know what I mean it she seems like the there would be something that it makes sense to just go for something get yeah, it done so she's quick she's the clear front runner uh, she's the bookies favourite she's been the bookies favourite uh, for a while now and she's been the favourite according to polls done of conservative members who are notoriously difficult to poll but she's been top of, of their list since um, January as well and in the contest in 2022 she came forth uh, but there was polling that showed that had she been up against Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak with the membership she would have beaten both of them. Mm. So she's got this little bit of sort of sense around her that she is, they tried Liz Trust, didn't work. They tried Richard, didn't work. She's a sort of the leader that never was. Um, but there are a lot of things about her that I think MPs are a bit wary of. She does have a tendency to rub people up the wrong way, <laughs> whether that is civil servants or the media or MPs, colleagues. And one of the things you have to do as opposition leader is be a really good communicator and really, really good at forging relationships. And she's someone I've I've had uh, allies of her in the party sort of say, she's not really one to work the commons tea rooms. And like if your allies are saying that, that you're yeah. not a good networker, then then that's uh that's not a massive mark in, in your favor. Also though, like she might be the front runner, but it's a pretty open field and there are only 121 MPs now in the parliamentary party so there is a sense that it, it could be anyone so the fact that MPs are casting around for other options I don't think is that much of a surprise. Mm. It does make it seem like a very long time that it takes and they're going to need 61 MPs to whittle it down at some point seems quite uh yeah strange they're drawing it out so much. John Badenoch's statement then that she's she's made around this what do you think to it? Her pitch to me seems quite American in this sort of bombastic style of politics, which we have taken over here a little bit. But do you think that will actually work with, say, down the line, if they ever think about winning an election again with the, the British public? So I think this is actually a broader problem for the right at the moment. Is coming to, there's, we've heard a lot about how you know, Twitter isn't the real world. Twitter is a liberal bubble. The right wing internet is also a bubble. Mm. And people in it say have a lot of strange opinions and convince each other of a lot of strange things that actually people out there who don't spend all, the t all their time on the internet don't think about and are kind of freaked out by. So this is sort of how the Tories ended up with Liz Truss as leader, for mm. example. This is how J.D. Vance has happened in the US. Mm. Um, and I think there is a risk that Badenoch is 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 playing to that kind of market. I mean, the line from her kind of opening statement that really leapt out at me is, um, the state should do fewer things better, which is actually, you know, that's not an insane prescription. 
I know some quite sensible Tories who think that this is where they went wrong with austerity, that what, instead of just like salami slicing everything, they should have fundamentally rethought what the job of the British state was and cut some things completely. I, I, I can see how you get there. It's kind of intellectually defensible. The difficulty is like, how are you going to win an election by saying, well, we're just not going to do that thing that you like? I don't see that as a, as a sort of winning proposition. And it does kind of have, you're right, it's quite American in that there is this kind of suspicion of the state in American politics that I don't think we have here. Like, mm. I think we are in Britain more likely to see the state as an enabling force rather than a, a barrier to change. But I kind of agree with Rachel. The bigger problem with, with Bednock is actually not that kind of pitch at all. It's sort of more about who she is. Mm. Like the Tories I've spoken to about this, they worry about the fact she's a bit of an introvert. They worry about the fact she has no interest in economics. Um, but the biggest problem that's quite is a big she's... One, isn't it? it is quite uh, a big one. That's made me like her a little bit more, though, I feel I can relate. <laughs> in numbers. The biggest problem, though, is she's... Um, I think the, the gentle way of putting it would be combative. Yeah. Um, like the first time she, a lot of people in the media became aware of her was when like um, the the Huffington Post journalist yeah. Nadine White yeah. asked her a question uh, and instead of answering it, uh, Badenoch just kind of tweeted her, her level of outrage that she'd even been asked. You can just about get away with that when you're in government. As also, leader when of the it's a junior journalist, yeah. doesn't yeah. Nadine Watts, she's you had can, a big promotion. You so, can't, as but, leader of the opposition, go around attacking senior it's journalists outrageous. And, expect, I got to and expect coverage for it. It's just not how the power balance works. I think the problem is, like the, one, the thing that a lot of the party like about her is that she's quite aggressive with the party's enemies. The problem is she's exactly the same with the people they're going to need to convince and also with her own colleagues. It's just not the skill set you actually want in a leader. Mm. Rachel, another name then, Pretty Patel. Within the party, is she particularly popular anymore? And is her issue maybe more external appeal than within within the party? So I think Priti Patel is the, the dark horse to watch. K. Badenoch's the front runner. Priti Patel is uh, the, the uh, underdog. Um, she has the advantage of not having served with either Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. Um, she was Boris Johnson's Home Secretary, but she's got a bit of distance from the more recent failures. She's also got the uh, advantage of being incredibly integrated within the wider party ecosystem. The members really like her. She's been a, a member for a long time. She understands the local associations. She understands the party structure. And that's important. If you think about Rishi Sunak, he had basically no relationship with the Conservative Party before he was selected to be mm. an MP. And then he was prime minister sort of nine years later. And that's considered a, a problem that he didn't really understand the party that he was trying to lead. Um, Set against that, she's Preeti Patel. Um, she's <laughs> <laughs> sort of says yeah. she's very clearly from the right wing of the party. She is uh, there's a footage of her dancing with Nigel Farage. Obviously, she has come out and said that she wouldn't let him back into the party, uh, but she is very, very clearly the candidate of those in the Conservative Party who think that the issue was reform and they weren't right wing enough and they weren't. Tory enough. And there's really only space for one candidate like that to get through to the final two. I do think that if Preeti Patel was in the final two, members would choose her. Um, but MPs are wary of her. She's also got a whole lot of bullying allegations from when she was in the Home Office. And I think if they're going to rally around a right-wing candidate, obviously Suella Braverman has ruled herself out um, quite explosively. Uh, but I think they would probably choose either Kemi Badenoch, who's trying to do the kind of sensible right winger pitch, or Robert Jenrick, who's trying to do the sensible right wing pitch, but white and male. And I think mm. uh, he also likes he also likes houses. That's not a small thing. He does he does like houses, but I I think that it's hard to see Priti Patel beating both of those to to be the candidate of the right in the final two. John, I hate to do this to you, but can you explain Priti Patel's? logic as to why she thinks it should be her. So I thought the line about wanting to put unity before a personal vendetta was interesting because it raises questions about who exactly this vendetta is against. <laughs> um, I mean, she's she's basically just sucking up to the membership, isn't she? Like she's like like she put out this statement calling the membership heroes who are yeah. and blaming politicians who fell fell out and left us short. Um, which is, you know, she was obviously conveniently far from the scene of the crime, as as Rachel said. Um, I mean, it sort of makes sense. I imagine that's how a lot of people in the party will be feeling. 
but she sort of has to get there first. She has to win over the MPs to kind of get in front of the membership. And it's not clear um, that she's going to be able to do that because if, I mean, one simple thing, which is like, Savanta did some polling on on how the various candidates rank. P- P- uh, Dame Pretty is by far the least popular. Like she's at minus twenty eight approval rating. But is with that the public. is that the public as a whole? Uh, that's with the public, but uh, and with the party. Like it's different numbers, but she's bottom for both. Um, I mean, it feels to me like she's basically the sort of like if Sula Braverman was very slightly nicer. That's kind of the pitch she's making. <laughs> she, in that she's quite nice to her colleagues. And in she does have Bravman a sense of humour, which Bravman yeah. doesn't. No, she's liked within the party, whereas ever, no one can stand Suella. No, she's mm, like, toxic even yeah, among... Everyone hates her. Yeah. So, like, I mean, I, I just don't really see how she kind of gets to that final two. She's also, though, she's got a bit of the Boris momentum behind her. And the, the thing she said about the members being really important, like wanting to give members more votes, she was part of that group that sort of felt that Boris Johnson had been unfairly ousted so trying to get a bit of Boris Johnson momentum although I should say that Boris Johnson's book his memoir is coming out right in the middle I also never want to hear the phrase Boris Johnson momentum again (laughs) Rachel I'll I'll be honest with you I'm going to get it into every podcast that we do but yeah uh, 10th of October look out for Boris Johnson's memoir which is going to come out slap bang in the middle we'll have to we'll have to get him on the podcast see what he has to say (laughs) Hannah you've mentioned James Cleverly already and that he is a very good communicator and we particularly saw that, I felt, when he was in the, the Foreign Office. He did feel very slick in that sort of way. Well, yes and no. Yes, I do agree with you overall. Yeah. Um, and he definitely has the broadest appeal, I would mm. say, of the candidates. I think he's probably, if they were sensible, he's who they'd go for because he's the most likely to transform the party into something that the people, the general electorate, are going to take seriously again, which probably means they won't go for them, him at all. Um, he does have that broad appeal. He's, he was wise enough to say that Rwanda was a ridiculous idea privately, but of course he didn't. You can say batshit on this podcast. Batshit, yeah, Yeah. can say it. Does he get an easy ride though then, John, on the not that bad scale of things? I mean, yeah, we're grading on a hell of a curve. I mean, like, what (laughs) what did I just say? He just, he held, he was Home Secretary and Foreign Secretary and he didn't massively fuck either of those up. Mm. That's, that does kind of put him in the top 2% of the last government. wildly offensive. Yeah. It's difficult to think of a particularly strong attack line against him. But Mm. it's, that doesn't mean he will necessarily be an amazing leader. It means you can't, immediately see what his vulnerabilities are. Well, could an attack line against him, Rachel, perhaps be that he's he's somewhat a little bit living in the past? You mentioned Priti Patel and her Boris Johnson momentum. Again, please don't use that phrase too often. <laughs> but might he? he's trying to get some sort of Boris Johnson momentum, isn't he? In a piece in Conservative Home, he said he successfully got the campaigning machine into shape to help Boris win that fantastic victory over the Corbynistas to get Brexit done. It doesn't look like the Corbynistas are in charge to me Probably at the moment, not, no. and they're not really the enemy that the Tories have to face anymore. So is he just a little bit, he's kind of relying on, he's not got the, the recent baggage as much as it doesn't feel, but he's got that old baggage, which he's trying to turn to a positive. It doesn't seem What I think what smart. he's trying to do is remind uh, MPs uh, and the membership that there was a time in the not so distant past where the Conservatives could win elections, in fact, where they won a landslide victory and that he was an important part, he says, he was integral to that team. So it's not so much, I think, associating himself with Boris Johnson uh, or with the the campaign against against Jeremy Corbyn it's specifically trying to associate himself with victory you know I'm a winner yeah. I I I know how to win and uh, I think given that he's also got the baggage although I I, I agree with Hannah, that he he didn't fuck anything up um, massively but he is still the home secretary who was home secretary for the Prime Minister who led the party to a historic mm. defeat. So I think he's trying to balance that record and, and say like, yes, I was part of the team that meant that there's now, you can now walk the length and breadth of England and Wales without ever stepping into a Conservative seat. And, and that's not great. <laughs> um, but I was also part of this other team that was uh, electable. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to do a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour around some of the last three who I think I don't want to make us hostages to fortunes but do feel maybe the the lesser likely of the six. So Hannah, Tom Tugendhat, he seemed in some ways I hate to say this but you know sensible. He seemed like a little bit one of the more grown-up Tories and to use all those sort of cliches. But then he did also say he'd be open to leaving the ECHR Is he a little bit almost, he's kind of, with the membership, mired by his sensible brand and this desperate 
attempts to win over the wingnuts might not work because yeah. I just see him as someone I'm like, well, you are quite sensible and now you're, you're kind of doing what Rishi Sunak had to do, which is going, oh no, I'm nuts. But I promise <laughs> so, yeah, you. He definitely is the one, the only one really who's truly seen as that kind of one nation conservative mm. candidate. But although, as you point out with his comments about, um, you know, the uh, EACR, it, it kind of whack, that that definition of one nation kind of waxes and wanes a bit at the moment mm. while the party's struggling to work out what it is so um who knows i feel like he's quite malleable actually uh to if in, in his attempt to win and the length of the contest might uh, means that he might start to say some really insane things towards the end of it um to keep attention on him his big pitch is that the tory party should keep its promises which to me doesn't really feel like any kind of <laughs> ideological statement but basically a no. sentiment that is rooted in just decency yeah, like, that's what you tend to tell children well really. true true but then you know wouldn't it be nice if the basis was that all of these <laughs> candidates were saying things that they intended to actually do um he doesn't really have an ideological pitch in that sense. And, and this idea of his one nationism, you know, is, is going a bit thin now. He's military, so that sometimes works in favour. He, he hasn't mentioned that. <laughs> a bit like the toolmaker. <laughs> uh, did you know? And then he, he's also very anti-Farage, and he's been quite clear about his position on mm. absolutely not welcoming Farage or any of the kind of sentiments that he uh, stands on into the party which both of which should play in his favor but i do weirdly think might rule him out in the party in its current form and particularly the the mps that remain hmm. uh robert jenrick then is another person john uh he's another person he is that's another how, person. I can, how i can <laughs> can uh, define him sorry but he was <laughs> He was deeply involved in a, a failing immigration system and now wants to put himself forward as someone who can do the right thing and fix it in whatever way that might mean fixing it. Does he have both too much baggage and too little charisma I mean, to succeed? I think so. So I've never quite been able to dissociate Robert Jemmerich from the fact he was the Bologna at university. He stood to be his college student uh, union president uh, and he lost an uncontested election. More people voted for reopen nominations than voted for him. And I just kind of feel like, is that the guy you really want to make your candidate for prime minister? Mm. Um, but but sensible Tories do keep making the case for him to me. Like his name is coming up as a more plausible. I mean, I don't know if you, you're hearing this too, yeah, Rachel, yeah. but like more, people I trust on this stuff are kind of saying, no, he could actually be the guy we want. Mm. They like the fact that he seems quite good at articulating the intellectual challenges facing the party. Uh, and I, I saw a lot of conservative approval of this four minute video that he made, sort of outlining what's gone wrong over the last 14 years. And I watched it. And it's a good video, but it all seemed pretty obvious to me. But that is being sort of held up as that he has the, mm. the, the, in, the intellectual ability to tackle the big questions like, who are we and what went wrong? I, he does seem to have kind of settled on, you know, we need to be tough on immigration, but also build some houses. And that's probably not a terrible pitch for the Tories electorally. Like, that's probably a place where they could start to rebuild from. Mm, I do worry that we're, we're saying they need a really big intellectual to sort out their problems when it does seem like it's mainly been, they've been shit and uh, sort of attacking each other constantly. But I don't know, perhaps I'm not as much of an intellectual as Robert Jenrick. Rachel, a final name, Mel Stride. Yeah. Who is he? <laughs> I can't believe you're asking me that. He's, oh, everyone knows who Mel Stride is, the, uh, the, the former Work and Pension Secretary, ah, obviously. Of um, course. Um, before that, he was chair of the Treasury Select Committee. He, though, became much more prominent during the election as basically the minister in charge of the morning broadcast round. He was very good at going on the broadcast round basically every single day and defending whatever awful thing had happened or the dire polling or the D-Day debacle or all of that. He's seen as a good media performer. He's seen as steady. He's seen as someone you can trust. Uh, I think he thinks that he could be a unity candidate, although there are a number of them saying they can be the unity candidate. And there aren't that many of them to unite, remember? There are only 121. Um, but I think of all of the people that we're talking about, none of them are running to be the caretaker leader. They're all saying that they could lead the party to election victory in 2029. But Mel Stride is, is kind of the caretaker candidate. He's the steady the ship and we'll figure out the leader that we actually want to try and get us into government when we've had some, some time to calm down and think about what we've done.
The Green Party won four seats in the last election. It campaigned on social housing, the NHS, and of course, climate issues, putting forward a nature act to protect and restore the natural world. But how will it hold this new Labour government to account? Our very own Andrew Harrison sat down with co-leader Carla Denia to discuss that and what the future of her party is. Take a listen. Carla Denia, welcome to Oh God, What Now? And congratulations on entering Parliament. Thank you. Are you enjoying it so far? Uh, yes, although it's very intense. There's so much to do. It's it's kind of a strange system in this country in that you get elected as an MP and you have to be doing the job immediately, unlike in the European Parliament or in the US where newly elected members have some time to get their office set up. So you're having to simultaneously make speeches in Parliament, hire your staff, do all the training all at once. You don't have like an onboarding uh, scenario. <clears throat> well, there is, but you have to do all the other things at the same time. <laughs> So you've joined Parliament at an absolute watershed time, the, at the end of 14 years of largely untrammeled Conservative power, during which time the, the environment's been seriously damaged, the NHS has been left underfunded, wages have stagnated. What do you see as the role for the Greens in the new Parliament? Because you're you're not exactly the opposition, but you're no longer a single MP. You're not like a sprinkling of, uh, you know, sort of minor figures on the fringes. Yeah, well, we're really pleased with our results in this election. We've quadrupled our representation in the House of Commons, and that follows a more than quadrupling of our number of councillors uh, elected at a local level over the last five local elections. So uh, although we're not a huge party yet, we are, we're pleased with that level of growth, and we will be looking in this parliament to hold the Labour government to account. There are some things that they have proposed or already done that we've long campaigned for and we support, like um, lifting the de facto ban on onshore wind, uh, proposing to bring the rail companies back into public ownership. That's something I've personally campaigned for for a long time as well. Um, but there are other areas where we think they're not going far enough on climate, as you mentioned, but also on inequality. Lifting the two-child benefit cap, for example, is something that I've long argued is a no-brainer, Is would be a, an actually quite cheap uh, as as government interventions go, change that the Labour government could make that would lift hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty immediately and and lessen the poverty for, for many hundreds of thousands more. Uh, and I, I think the case is really compelling and I think a lot of people are really disappointed that the Labour government have not only ruled out doing that, but kicking MPs out of their parliamentary party, suspending them for six months for suggesting that they should. And so I think that really shows the strength of having a handful of green MPs in the Commons chamber who can make that case, who are emphatically not whipped by Keir Starmer and can hopefully pull them in the right direction on a few issues. You increased your vote by more than a million votes this time. It came to 1.8 million, the most uh, the Greens have ever had, and you doubled your share to 6.4% of, of the national vote, as well as winning four MPs. It's quite a long way from sort of European levels of power where you're able to, you know, Greens in those countries are able to enter coalitions and, and, and affect, affect policy, but it's not insignificant. Do you now have to face the issue of shifting from being kind of like a, a, a pressure group with a foothold in Parliament to being an actual parliamentary party with issues of whipping and issues of portfolios and issues of shadowing and things like that? Uh, I'd slightly take issue with you describing the Green Party as a pressure group before. <laughs> our our theory of change has always been to get Greens elected directly into the Commons and into um, town and and city halls across the country to directly put forward the policies that we know this country needs. Although we recognise that Greens getting an increased vote share does have a secondary benefit of, of putting pressure on other parties to do the right thing. Uh, but this is, yeah, I'm sure it'll take some adjust adjusting having uh, four times as many MPs, but this is what we've been aiming for. We're, we're pleased to be in this position. Um, in terms of whipping, the Green Party actually takes a different approach here. Um, and it's not just the fact that we only had one MP before this election. The, on principle, the Green Party does not whip its elected mm -hmm. members. So that's the practice that we follow on local councils as well. We trust our me elected members to vote according to their conscience. Of course, we if you're a member of the Green Party, you're, you're sharing a, a set of common values and, and sharing broadly support for the same set of policies. But we trust our members that their conscience or their need to represent their constituents as, as well as party policy or simply their analysis of the relative benefits of or disbenefits of different aspects of what the government is putting forward might 
cause them to weigh it up slightly differently. My experience as a local green councillor in Bristol for nine years is that we voted together on almost everything, but occasionally a few members of the group might vote differently or abstain because they had a particular perspective. And that's that's respected. Yeah, it's not going to work in Parliament though. I mean, obviously you've got four MPs, so it's it's not you know you're not managing a mass of people. But the, cl- the closer you get to uh, you know a larger parliamentary presence, you, the more you you may find yourself having to adopt the tried and tested methods of the old parties. Uh, well, I was a member of a group of twenty four green councillors mm-hmm. on Bristol City Council, and we managed fine without whipping there. I actually used to be the whip of my local Green Council group. Whip. The not whip. Um, because although we don't whip as in tell yeah. people how to vote, that role was still needed because the other parts of the whip role in Parliament as well is negotiating with other parties about who who you're putting on which committee, who, who you know, opportunities to speak, um, procedure for you know, what's going to be on the agenda for certain meetings, that kind of thing. And so I did that. And as whip, I also did some of the legwork of researching and suggesting how we might vote. Um, at the time, I would describe it as I don't have a whip, but maybe I have a rolled up bit of newspaper. In, the, <laughs> in that, I would just gently cajole my colleagues into suggesting a way forward, but they weren't going to get any heavy consequences if they didn't do it. It would more be that I was the one doing the legwork of, well, here's what Green Party national policy says. Here's what the Labour administration on the council is proposing. Here's where they agree. Here's where they differ. I think on balance we should vote for this, but we should mention where we think it's not going far enough in the speech. But sometimes a colleague might think, no, that's a red line for me. I can't vote for it, yeah. for Roll, example. Rolled up a bit of recycled paper rather than yeah. you spoke, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to take the shine off your victory, which is a, a which was a, a, a real achievement. But And I know electoral politics is, is when it takes it all. <laughs> is there a bit of you that maybe regrets that your win had to come on the expense of Thangham Debonair, who's I widely admired, was set up to be a really good culture secretary, Obviously, you fight the constituency where you've got your roots, you fight to win. There's a little twinge, maybe, that Thangham Debonair had to be the person that you beat. Yeah, I've always been really clear that I hugely respected her work. She's a very hard work, she was a very hardworking constituency MP. And of course, I was a councillor in her constituency for her whole time as MP. So, interacted with her in her office quite a lot. Um, yeah, it was nothing personal targeting that seat. It's where I've lived for nearly 15 years and it was a seat that the Greens had a very good chance of winning because of how we'd done in local elections and, and generally the uh, popularity of, of Green policies in that area. To be honest, if we had a proportional voting system, which I and the Green Party support, then we might have um, constituency boundaries being different and or multi-member constituencies, hmm. which could have meant that Flangham and I could have both been MPs. But because uh, the Labour Party officially doesn't support proportional voting, and um, as far as I can tell, Flangham has stayed pretty quiet on whether she supports it or opposes it, it's Labour's resistance to a fair voting system that prevents that being possible, um, along with preventing us having a a system where the number of MPs from each party matches the number of votes cast for them. You could also find yourself showing a constituency with a reform MP as well, though. So you never know which way these things can go. Not very likely in Bristol. <laughs> it depends on how big the constituency is, I, I, I guess. Um, I want to ask you a bit more about the government's green plan, because obviously this is a huge focus for, for you. Labour has promised zero carbon electricity by 2030. Coal is almost gone as a power source in, in this country. <clears throat> the party said they double wind capacity on land, quadruple it offshore and triple solar power. But they have dropped the £28 billion green commitment. They did that quite early in the campaign. You've called their plans pretty timid. Give us your, your sort of overview on what Labour's doing on green stuff in particular. I think what you just said there is a good summary and... Well, my goodness, it's it's such a relief compared to the last fourteen years of mm-hmm. of the Conservatives increasingly giving in to the 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 culture war that's attempting to dismantle the cross party consensus on climate change. So at least we now have a government in power who who recognises that that the climate emergency is an emergency and we need to do something about it urgently. However, as you said, Labour U turned on their previously flagship. 28 billion climate investment pledge. And in place, the investment in Great British Energy is just 8.3 billion across the whole five year parliament. So that doesn't really touch the sides compared to what they were saying before. And the 28 billion that, that was previously their promise, that wasn't 
uh, you know, that wasn't just from them. Independent sources were saying that that was really the flaw of what was needed in terms of climate investment to get to net zero. So it was already the bare minimum and then they abandoned even that. And while the targets they've announced around a rollout of renewable energy is really welcome, and of course, as a former renewable energy engineer that worked in offshore wind specifically, I really welcome that. Electricity is, to some extent, the low-hanging fruit. That is the relatively easy stuff to decarbonise. It is um, buildings, especially the heating of our homes and transport, that are the tricky ones. Those are the ones that are proving hard to decarbonise in the UK so far and where I think there is a greater role for government intervention to speed up the process. And that's why, as the Greens, we have for years been pushing the previous government and now this government to roll out a nationwide home insulation program because that would bring down carbon emissions and bring down people's bills and give them warmer, more comfortable homes that's better for their health and therefore has lots of knock-on benefits like reducing the impact on the NHS. Uh, and that is the kind of area where a government intervention could make a big difference. And if local government had the powers and the funding to roll that out, to give households that need it direct financial support, grants, give middle-income households a blend of grants and access to affordable property-linked finance to, to make those changes. And of course, it would directly be council's responsibility to, to make changes to council homes. A change like that could make a huge difference, not just to the climate, but also to our quality of life every day. That was co-leader of the Green Party, Carla Denia, speaking to Andrew Harrison. Keep an eye out for a bonus episode with the full 30-minute interview coming very soon. Angela Rayner says Britain is in its most acute housing crisis of living memory. With that, she's laid out plans for scrapping planning red tape and a mandatory building target of 370,000 homes a year. Are Labour's goals realistic and are they dealing with the right parts of the crisis? Hannah, really wide question. I'll give you a little bit of time to answer it. Rayner speech, good or bad? Uh, well, I I thought generally very good. Okay. But And what we were expecting, it didn't surprise me in any way. Um, but it wasn't as well received as I thought it was going to be. No. So I think that's a, an interesting hint of the challenges that have come. So one of the issues that has immediately been a problem is that it hasn't yet come with a figure for social housing targets and housing association leaders, people in the sector are starting to get quite frustrated about that, mm. just as you know, ordinary voters are, who, especially with Rayner standing up there and her personal history, were expecting to hear something that had you know concrete numbers attached to it. Um, so there's a lot of focus on that to, as we record today on Wednesday. Um, and so that that's number one. But the second thing was that the kind of, it made me realise that nimbyism is going to be an even bigger problem. We know that nimbyism is a massive problem politically in this country. We know it's an issue in, in, in local government as well. Um, and in, within, you know, small communities right down to the kind of street versus street level. But... I don't think I had realised, despite my years of covering housing, quite how immediately it would become a massive problem for a government with such a significant mandate to actually hmm. put forward uh, its plans. Because, um, you know, the, it, from day one, Rayner's being steamrolled by some of these forces, even within her own party. So, I mean, we'll come, I'm sure we'll come to a lot of that in, in detail. But the speech, I think, that she... You know, her, her presentation, both in speeches that she made and also um, pieces she's written and presentation in interviews with Jeremy Vine uh, specifically, was, a, was an like extended interview, really set up that dynamic quite well for her to be quite insistent that, look, there is no room for manoeuvre here. So from, from my perspective, I think it worked out. I think, you know, yeah. the comms on it have worked out and, you know, we can be pretty confident that what they have in store is going to happen, but it's not going to be quite so straightforward as I thought it might be given the size of their majority. Did it provide the sort of as much clarity as you'd maybe hope for? Because for me, it feels yeah. like there's a lot of noise and numbers around all of this. And it felt a little bit like while it seemed a, a positive direction, that it also just added more noise and numbers to yeah, something which was already confusing. Yeah, a talk and perhaps less specifics, but the specifics were there. The problem is that unless you're like me and John 
some of the detail does isn't that easy to like talk about on you know Jerry Vine show or whatever. Sure. So but the detail is out for most of it now, except social housing numbers, as I've already said. So we know that mandatory housing targets are rising from three hundred thousand a year to three hundred and seventy thousand a year with all areas obliged to build. And bearing in mind the current projection right now, like under the legacy of the Tories, was way below their actual target. So our current projection of how many homes we were going to build this year is was about two hundred thousand. So it's almost an overnight doubling. So it is a genuine immediate uplift in development numbers. The numbers, I think, are pretty solid, but they will need coercion. And there's there's been some specifics on that as well. So Rayner said, and this is a direct quote, that under the new planning regime, all local authorities will have a duty to del- deliver more homes. And unless they produce a clear plan for how that's going to happen, ministers could step in and take over the process. I said on this podcast a couple of weeks ago that there's absolutely no appetite for anything that looks like Great British housing or some kind of, you know, centralised control. Actually, gave this gave me some hope that maybe I was wrong and that there is such an you know, appetite for getting things done that they will be quite strict about mm. making sure that, that local authorities don't sh- find ways around mm. their, their obligations. So that's quite exciting. Um, it also included um, mandatory reviews of green, green belt land everywhere with this urge to find what they're calling the grey belt, that stuff like abandoned um, scrubland, car parks, that kind of thing on which they can build. Uh, there's one controversial thing that's brought all the NIMBYs out is that they are removing the requirement of beauty from the planning proposal. So you don't have to demonstrate that something's going to look that nice. Actually, that sounds terrible when you just say it as a sentence. In fact, that that requirement in the previous planning legislation didn't actually mean that there was a commitment to getting really stunning developments. You look around any new build and you you can you, you know that, that it's not actually delivering its intentions. There's two more things I think we should mention. Right to buy restrictions. Raina says that she's going to m- introduce some to basically make it less appealing and try to sell fewer homes through right to buy. Um, equally, um, she will try and she'll make sure she gives councils the ability to reinvest proceeds from sales those sales in new homes. Mm. So that's a good thing. I think she's probably slightly naive about how much less appealing it will make right to buy. I think there will still be high demand for it. Um, but you know, it's a step in the right direction on that. John, how do you feel about the the whole thing generally? I mean, I know I'm, I'm I can assume you're quite happy about the war on NIMBYs, but generally. So in some ways, I'm a bit freaked out by the the war on the NIMBYs because I've been advocating for that for about eleven years, and generally, when governments start doing what I want, it's not a sign that they're onto good and popular things. It's a sign things are going to go terribly wrong. Um, but I do think there are there are a couple of arguments for kind of like really kind of going after the, the tendency for people to just think they can block housing. One of which is that I think people don't necessarily connect their desire to protect the disused petrol station or bus station, whatever the hell it is at the end of the street. They don't connect their desire to kind of keep that undeveloped with the fact that they they have kids who can't buy a home. And still living upstairs. They just don't connect the two. So kind of like saying repeatedly over and over again, no, we do need to redevelop these things. We are, these is calling, this is causing a national problem um, is important. Also, I think there's a particular, there's a weird psychological thing around these kind of changes to kind of the, the urban space that people think they have a right to say no in a way they don't in other policy areas. Like, you know, the last government did loads of terrible things that I opposed, but I didn't actually think that the fact I opposed them meant (laughs) in and of itself that they should stop. Um, But for some reason, when it comes down, when it comes to like building on that patch of land at the end of the street, people genuinely think they get a veto. So I think kind of like just pushing back on that and saying, no, the public should not always have this power to say no, is probably a good thing in kind of changing the whole psychology around this stuff. Mm. Rachel, in terms of the party management side of this, I suppose, the, I know the media are obviously feeling quite desperate, the, to- the tabloid media particularly, for there to be some friction within Labour. Does this actually you know, put forward any sort of party management issue with Yimby versus yes in my backyard versus not in my backyard for, for anyone who's not quite there yet sorry if you weren't quite there because we've been saying nimby a lot but that that kind of party management is that a serious thing to consider or realistically is it that the yimbys are going to win it seems well it's a really interesting question because one of the things i said before the election when it looked like labor were heading for a huge majority is they were going to have mps in so many different parts of the country that 
achieving their housing targets without pissing off any of the locals in those areas and therefore making the seats that they just won, basically uh, the seats that they're going to lose in the next election, was going to be impossible. And I remember saying, I think on this podcast, that they're going to have to make a decision at the beginning to to piss people off early and to say, look, we won some of these seats. You're not going to have it in five years' time or we're not going to let you keeping your seats Mm -hmm. prevent us from building in in the way that we need to. So I think... Or the way you keep your seat is we build homes for Labour voters there. Indeed. You know, if, you, if, you can, if you can get the homes built within five mm. years, suddenly maybe you'll, you'll have more of a chance. Um, but uh, just the sheer size of the majority automatically makes that a challenge. There's another challenge, though, which I think is, is interesting. The Labour MP Clive Lewis uh, tweeted about the 53 or 54 MPs who have sort of signed up for growth, who have signed up for development uh, and said, you know, yeah, let's go for it. Um, And he essentially said that every, what was the phrase that he used? Every developer with a shitty plan is now going to have a short list of places to build, essentially, um, that they had opened themselves up for, of course, unquote, the wrong kind of development. And Nibbyism, I think, is quite interesting because... A lot of it is, I like that view. I don't want you to build on that view. I don't care that people can't have homes. But I feel like there's a left wing and a right wing variant. The right wing variant is often either if young people can't afford homes because they're not working hard enough. In my day, we all managed it, so it was fine. Or it's tied to immigration. You know, the young people, young British people would be able to buy homes if we hadn't let all the immigrants in. Um, And therefore, we don't need to build more. We just have to send the immigrants back. The left wing version of it is building homes is capitalist or building homes that are built by private developers who then make a profit off those homes is capitalist and that is wrong and the way that we solve the housing crisis is to abolish landlords like that would help um and i think that's a, a kind of it, it's quite disingenuous but it's also kind of quite appealing because landlords among young people particularly young labor voters are not a particularly popular class and rightly so but the the sort of anti-capitalist building all these homes is bad for social equality that messaging on the left of the labor party i think could be quite insidious i mm. genuinely think that part of left nimbyism comes from the fact that the people who advocate house building on the internet are generally centrist, mm. relatively. Mm. And if you're on the left, you find those people, these people, quite <laughs> annoying. <laughs> so I do genuinely think it's why it's Twitter poisoning. It's like people with that, that guy who I think is a dick thinks we should build homes. Therefore, the socialist position is to oppose that. Um, and it's nonsense. It's just like, you know, the way you deal with all of these, if we had enough homes, yeah, it would be become fun. less profitable to be a landlord. Yes. It would not be a valuable investment. And yeah, you know what? Someone is going to make money out of building the homes. We live in a capitalist society. Someone's going to make money out of doing literally fucking anything. <laughs> and it just, sorry, this, I've gone all incoherent because this really winds me up. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. I think uh, uh, John Rant was what we were mm. we were expecting uh, within this section. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to the end of Oh God What Now? Thank you to Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. And thank you, John. Thank you. And thank you to Carla Denya too. If you want to listen to the full interview with her, we'll release that as a bonus episode very soon. Stick around for the extra bit after Demon is a Monster by Corner Shop and a hearty salute to our generous supporters, without whom we couldn't keep making the podcasts. It really is as simple as that. So why not join them for as little as £3 a month and get the podcast early and with our ads plus lots more. Search Oh God What Now Patreon to find out how. We'll see you next time. Hello and a big thank you for supporting us to Chris Dawson, Asta Evans, Michael Reeve, Carolyn Ward and Ingrid Morris. A big hello from me and enormous thanks to Tom Berry, Matthew Laws, Brian Roberts, Steve Webb and Joe Adams. And finally, a salute from me to the following Steadfast followers, Jessica Varek, Gary Carter, Anna, Ant Brown, and returning to Reup is backing after a period away, welcome back to Jack Jefferson. 